On this week's episode of the Indie Center Podcast, we sit down with a professional stuntman, fight coordinator, actor, and screenwriter, Enrique Guzman. But before we get into that, a word from our sponsors. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Uh, it's free. I could probably end the list right there, but I'm going to continue. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Speaking from personal experience, creating a podcast felt so overwhelming. Uh, I I didn't know where to start, uh, but using Anchor was a no-brainer. Their website and app is user-friendly. You're able to navigate through it easily. It's pretty cool, guys. Uh, You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. A one-stop shop. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This episode of the Indie Center Podcast is brought to you by Spotify, the place where you can listen to your favorite artists and podcasts for free. Did you hear me? You don't even need a premium membership. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcast so you never miss an episode. Are you subscribed to me yet? Wink, wink. Uh, Premium users can download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are. And that is so convenient. How many times have you found yourself in an airplane or driving down a road with no reception and you just want to escape but can't? You are stuck sitting next to somebody that snores or you're stuck in a meaningless conversation and you just want to listen to podcasts. Well, now you can, guys. And you can easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app and search for Andy Center Podcast on Spotify or browse podcasts in the Your Library tab. Also, make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode. Thank you for sitting down with me, Enrique. How are you doing, brother? Excellent, excellent. How are you, Luis? I am great, man. Beautiful day. Uh, thank you for accepting the invite. Um, you have a lot of things going for you. You're, uh, you do MMA, you do stunt work, you're a fight coordinator, you're an actor, you write your own films, and you've been a part of plenty of independent films. So I want to kind of dig into you know, your, your, your history and, and how it came okay. about. Um, so where did your love for the physical start? Oh, my God. I, well, being born in Puerto Rico. Being born in Puerto Rico, we didn't have uh, you know, video games, or we couldn't afford them. Our, our playground was, you know, La Finca, you know, in the back, uh, in El Rio. So it started very young. I mean, I lived out there till when I was going to about 13, and I remember either breaking bones, jumping up on mountains with little cousins. So I was physical from, from the very get, from the very get. <laughs> so you were so one of those hyper kids? One of those hyper kids, you know, and, and of course the love for film. My father, my father used to uh, take us to the movies to watch all the, you know, Bruce Lee movies. and. It, it was not even dubbed in, in Spanish, so we didn't know English, but whatever, <laughs> or even the Chinese. We just went, and then we ended up trying. We're all little ninjas in Puerto Rico. So that's that's mainly where it came from. So they, the so they didn't dub the Bruce no, Lee No, back then, no. Back then, it, it was like, what, what was it in? It, it, was just, language? it was just either English or Chinese, Cantonese, or however they had it really? over there. But we didn't care, because we were there for all the fighting, all the fighting, and we're, me and my brothers and my friend, we were ready to try that uh-huh. when, we were, when we went back home with the kids. Um, so that's really where it started. Really, really where it started. Well, we didn't play any sports. Our parents didn't, they, they couldn't afford, you know, gloves or bats. So it was just, you know, going ham out there as kids. <laughs> I haven't thought about that in years. I haven't thought about that in years. So you left Puerto Rico when you were uh, 13 years old? Yeah, 13 years old. My father was a cop over there and he was being threatened a lot. And, you know, it, the pay, until today, the pay, the pay was horrible. So he decided, I'm going to move my family to, uh, to, well, uh, even though we're part of the U.S., because I want to move them to Chicago, either Texas or Florida. We ended uh-huh. up here in Chicago. 
because he didn't want us either dead or, or worse following in his footsteps as cops over in Puerto Rico. Yeah. So we moved all out here and, you know, this, I ended up playing more sports and not as physical over there because there's no Rios, they don't even got Lake Michigan here. And then it just wasn't the same. Uh, but we're still very physical. That's basically where everything started. So before you left uh, Puerto Rico, did you get into like the gangs? Is there like a bunch Puerto of gangs? Rico? There? No, no gangs in Puerto Rico. Really? Yeah, no gangs in Puerto Rico. Over there, it's just, you know, we, we're going to play games. We're going to play ninjas. We're going to play class and robbers with the block from here, from the block, you know, ahead of us. Uh -huh. It was never, I didn't know anything about gangs so I got here to Chicago. I had no <laughs> idea what gangs were. None, zero. So when you got to Chicago, uh, what else did you get into? Now nah, here were all the gangs. Well, my father's very. <laughs> so you strict. got into a gang. That's the no, first thing. No, no, no. Right? My father's very strict. You know, we used to go to church. Oh, they make us go to church. And uh, you know, now I started being me and my older brother. We started realizing there's gangs and people were starting to approach us. Yeah. And we thought about it because we didn't see, we didn't see the bad yet. Yeah. And then, but my father was all over it. So he was like, cool, go ahead, join the gang. Join the gang if you want to, join the gang. And at this to. time, was your dad was, uh, still a cop? No, 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 he didn't know English. Now he went from a cop and you know, a high-ranking police officer in Puerto Rico to working at a warehouse here in Chicago, in uh -huh. Chicago. Um, overnight, as a matter of fact. He was very strict. He just said, all right, join the gang because I'm gonna beat you worse than any gang. <laughs> and we decided we didn't. We didn't you want didn't to want do to test that. that. But we ended up having to fight our way not to get in the gang. Really? So my brother's constantly getting chased, constantly running. We ended up having to join sports just to stay away from the street. So we still very physical with that. And we're, you know, to this day, you know, very grateful, but it was very hard the first few years. Uh, so yeah. how did you get into MMA? Ooh. So fast forward to high school, graduated. Um, I wanted to go, um, I didn't want to go to college. And I know I didn't have the money to travel. So what's the easiest thing? Have somebody else pay me to travel. So then I wanted to join the Navy, because it just sounded cool. But then I realized that the Navy boot camp was here in, in, in Illinois. And I was uh -huh. like, I want to travel. I don't want to stay here. In yeah. I was like, oh, what else? What else can I go? And I, my brother was already in the Army. And I, I didn't like that green uniform. So I said, ah, let me join the Marine Corps. Get to go to, go to, get to, go to you California. You the Marine? I joined the Marine Corps. Wow. So we get to go to California. We get to do all these things. Boom. Join the Marine Corps, get to, get to travel everywhere, the Philippines, Japan, you know, all, all some places that, that otherwise I couldn't go to. Imagine as a 19-year-old going, yeah. going, uh, going to the Philippines. This is amazing. But then that, that's why I was introduced to MMA. Um, in the Philippines or just in the in, Philippines? In the but back then it wasn't called MMA. Back then it was just, you know, cross-training from a wrestler to a kickboxer to a jiu-jitsu. You know, that they, they didn't have that name mix yet. They were yeah, just, yeah. you know, you're going to cross train, you're going to cross train, you're going to cross train. And I did all that. Then I left the Marine Corps and jumped straight to being a police officer here in Chicago for a suburb up north. And just because I, I, I knew that I wanted to be, that I need, for any situation, I didn't want to pull out my gun. Yeah. I, I had to either use my mouth or, or my hands. You know, I stood focused on mixed martial arts and, you know, protecting myself, not getting sued because I pulled my gun on somebody and somebody had a stroke. Yeah. Um, and to this day, thank God, I've never been sued, not once as a police officer or as anything else. But that's where MMA came from. And then, you know, by then I already had military background. Now I have fighting background. I crashed a few uh, vehicles, uh, cop vehicles before, so a little bit of stunt vehicle driving came into play with that because I got, I got sent to four different uh, uh, serious uh, driving schools just because I was crashing vehicles left and right. <laughs> so that is just, I just happened to, to, to fall into that and I was blessed with that. So when you were in MMA, did you ever like think about getting into like the competitive sports and I did sports. I did I did I did you know after a while you want to test yourself I didn't want to test myself in the street right so I wanted to test myself in a, in a controlled environment where I could say quit or I could say ouch or I could say you broke it oh my god so yeah I ended up fighting in a cage and then well back then it didn't have cages back then it was rings right so now we're fighting and we're, we're going for takedowns and people are falling off the rings because yeah because of the, the, uh, ropes. the ropes so uh, I did that a for about three four years and the cage came along then now you, you know the more and more people are getting involved and now it's getting a little bit more painful now i'm, I'm breaking ribs going to work with a broken nose trying to explain 
what, why, I'm, <laughs> why in the beginning of the shift my nose is bleeding, uh, and I can't really tell them. Yeah, I'm a cage fighter, you know, in yeah. my off time because back then it was it was a no no. Back then it was illegal. You know, I had to drive either to Ohio or Indiana. That's what we were doing. All the guys in Chicago really? were underground doing that. It's illegal. It was illegal back then. In oh, Illinois, wow. we couldn't do it. We had to either drive in Indiana, which was legal over there, and or drive into Ohio, which was legal over there. Yeah, you couldn't do that. Here it was just either boxing or kickboxing. Ain't no injury, no elbows, no no knees. knees You're not fighting yeah. people, people that are either bigger than you or smaller than you. But Indiana, it was a free for all. Ohio, the same thing was a free for all. So we were driving back and forth ooh, for about six, seven years until they made it, you know, legal here in Illinois. Uh, did you want to ever get into boxing? Did you ever like? Try I did. That? I did boxing, but I did. Mm. I love the sport, but in either uh, real life or, or competition, I, you know, I want to be able to use all my tools. Okay. That's just my hand. Um, so how did you get into stunt work? As you said, you were sketching cars and shit. So. So so since I became a cop of really young age, uh, right around 21. Around 32, 33, I was already bored. I was like, I cannot do this for another 10, 15. I can't, I can't. You know, I go and I, and I hear people's, um, everything that, that people, the worst that people could do to do to people, right? Uh -huh. I didn't want to go and do that for 12 hours and then go home with a smile. It was it was taking a toll on, on myself. It was getting a toll on my kids. By then, I, by, I think by the eighth year, I went through a divorce because I kept everything in. I wasn't really, I wasn't open about it. I wasn't even, I didn't feel like I needed to talk about it. I was young and stupid. You were going through what, like all the like hardships that come with being a cop? Yeah, a, a story. Um, you know, my second daughter was about six months old. I get a call uh, at work um, to a house, you know, where I worked that's up north. It's a very rich town. So you're going into a mansion, you know, uh, a guy called around 2 o'clock in the morning saying that his his daughter was unresponsive. I'm like, oh my God, you get those calls. Like, oh my God. Um, we get there and he he's, he's, he has a stone face, very serious. And you know, when people go are in shock or trauma or whatever, they, they respond differently. So yeah, that was yeah. okay. I didn't think anything of it. I get there, I'm the first officer on the scene. I'm saying, where's your daughter? He's like, yeah, she's over here. He takes me to the kitchen. And he points, she's over here, she's over here. I'm like, where? She's over here. I'm like, where? She's in the microwave. I'm like in the oh microwave. my Bro, god I'm the microwave, and I'm like, well, why is she in the microwave? Oh and my god! With a stone god. face, with a stone face, you know, he's telling me that his wife is at work. Um, she just started going back to work. This, this baby's three months old, and she's been crying all night, and he didn't know what to do. So he put her in the microwave and turned the microwave in, microwave. Oh. On. So now, my daughter is about five, six months. I'm looking at this guy, right? And you know, personal. You know, the first thing you want to do is take take out your gun and just you just completely just end him. Done, done. Oh so now I gotta keep God. my composure. Get back on the radio. What happened to the baby? A, a, call a, a call a medic. And at that point, I didn't want to open the uh, for his sake. I didn't want to open I, the microwave. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah no, the you were by was, yourself at this point. The baby. What happened? You were by still yourself. by myself. Still uh, by and, myself. The, and the baby at this point was what? The baby is still in the microwave. Oh my still god! Oh my no god! No sound, no nothing. So then uh, I relay that information to the fireman and my supervisor and another officer on the scene uh, to to respond to the scene. Yeah. And all I had to say is I need a a, a medic here. And I need a supervisor, and they already know that that's key. That something's very serious. So I get there, and I, I relay this to this to, to these firemen. And imagine, I'm, at that time, I'm about five seven, 140 something pounds. Yeah. Now these firemen, they're they built like football players. Yeah. Built like, I let them know what happened, and as soon as they open and what they saw, all of these firemen, and now a supervisor that's Come been a police officer 25 plus years. They're breaking down because they've never seen the anything like that. Died. The guy, and the worst thing, the guy was a doctor. The guy was, the father was a doctor. He just snapped. He didn't know, he just snapped. Just oh snapped. Oh my God. Just snapped. Now, I never mentioned that to, to my wife at the time. I just yeah. went, did my job, and I went home, and she's like, how was work, honey? I told her, work was, you know, work. And you never, you never you, mentioned you that to her say, to this day. I never, you didn't never say, mentioned I don't want to talk about nothing, it. But that's just, that's just calls. That's just different calls that I've Bro. gotten throughout. So imagine that and thinking, I got another 10, 15 years of that. Not having it, not having it, not having it. That was one of the main calls that made me realize, you know what, I won't do this all the time. I like 
being the first one on the scene and helping people. Yeah. Because that's just one bad story, but, but I have a ton of great stories of being the first on the scene and saving lives. Oh, yeah. That, but seeing those. But they, then you have to go through the shit where you find kids in a microwave, man. That's all, like, never in my life. Like, I, I could, you know, I dealt with, um, with bank robbers easy because you're a cop yeah. cops in back hey easy yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. told me you're gonna Played go to the at 2 o'clock in the morning yeah with a baby in the microwave nobody Man, told me so that. Uh, my mother's uh, ex-husband he's a he's a cop and he would tell me that being a cop changes your life it does and Absolutely. like he oh, says you know in the beginning he was a happy guy but being a cop for so long like you end up growing to be you, you end up growing to have a heart uh thick skin hardened heart and he says you see shit he's like i'm so used to dead bodies they look fake mm-hmm. i don't i don't think twice about a dead body Walk around there, yeah. but he says one thing that always sticks with him is um children oh it does 100 percent. my god 100%. so was that the, the the final straw that broke the camel's back no no, no 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 how long how long more did you do that after seeing the baby i think for an extra year you well, didn't see the baby in the microwave right i did see the baby but i did see you the, did? just read like like Burn like burn spots oh, and just peaceful. Like the baby oh, was, it wasn't moving; God. it was dead. It was. It was there like was no way to resuscitate. Oh, it was no, done, nothing. Done. It, it was, she was bleeding through the eyes and through. It was oh, done. It was done. God. All right. All right let's, so yeah. Whew. So after that, it wasn't something you know. Something. It was just. I think it was just something dumb and mundane because I remember. I remember I was working nights again, and yeah. then. By the time the end of shift came, you know, I had turned in my badge and my gun. I told my supervisor, do it. you know, I, at first I told him I couldn't do it. I don't want to do this anymore. He said, Enrique, I get it. Take six months off. He gave me, I would work with a great supervisor. He said, take six, seven months off. The job would still be here. And I, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. But after that, I was, you know, by then I was sleeping better. <laughs> I was, my attitude was like just a little bit better. I was yeah. I was being more understanding. Yeah, yeah. And I decided to just do something else. And then I just happened to stumble into friends that were filming, like on Chicago PD, yeah, Chicago yeah. Fire. They needed needed uh, experienced police officers with time. And by then, was it I was, like extra work or what was it? No, it wasn't extra work. It was actual. Uh, uh, what's that word? Uh, you know, when, when, when you're be, as an advisor, how to advise Got John Cena, okay. how to walk as a police officer, how to okay. talk, the lingo, the police driving, training, police training, kind of like, training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. And that's how I ended up stumbling into that part. Oh my and then I, I ended up loving it, the behind the scenes, and I didn't went to school for that. So then I said, let me try to do extra work just to see how yeah. different people, uh, directors, assistant directors, the lingo. I didn't know the lingo, and I hate reading books. So I was like, I need to see, I need to see, I need to see how people do yeah, things. Yeah. And that's all I learned, and I, I realized, oh, I want to do this for a living. I want to be an actor, I want to be a stunt. And guy. how old were you when, when you came to this? Uh... I am 42 right now. This is 35. I was 35 when, when this kicked off. Just a fucking, I'm going to throw it out there. You don't look 42, bro. You look oh, like... Appreciate it, appreciate it. That's my daughters, man. You you have kids. They keep you on your toes. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm running left there, and you got babies, so you're going to... I'm running around... <laughs> I'm, running, I'm chasing her. And then when they get older, you're chasing boys. Oh, oh my God. Oh, I got my shotguns ready, bro. Loaded. And you're right. Did you see that video by that dude sneaking up on my daughter? Uh, yeah, I did. Oh, my I... God. <laughs> you how recorded did, it? How do you beat up a kid that's trying to be nice to your daughter that did it the right way? Wait, like, <laughs> <laughs> he came up behind her after a after foot because she's a cheerleader. Yeah. And he's in the football team. I don't know this cat from nothing. Yeah. And we're taking, at the end of the game, we're taking pictures of, of my daughter and her cheerleading team. And then we're about to go home. I'm still recording. And this dude comes behind her, this football player in his football gear, yeah. looking all cool with a big old it, it, sign. Yeah, sign yeah. said, would you come flowers. to a hoko with me? I was like, what the hell is a hoko? What are you calling my daughter? <laughs> and my ex-wife is like, that's homecoming. That's homecoming. I was like, all right. I was like, you might not, my daughter better not have a weird nickname. A out hoko. There. I was like, what the hell is a hoko? That's homecoming. I was like, who says that? <laughs> He was all right. He was all right. All right. All right. Uh, so did you uh, talk to him afterwards? Yeah, or I what talked was that? to him. I talked to him. He shook it. He shook my hand. Did you break said, it? Did you freaking grip it? Like I'm no, no, no. I, I, I do this thing right that I hold the hand and you look longer it than it really should. And you look at him. And just look at him. And just be like, oh, okay, and just start asking him questions. But me holding his hand is the worst thing that for a kid is the worst thing. Because even his father said he's laughing. He said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I did that before with my oldest, the crushing of the hand, but it was too fast. 
And I realized that the guy, you know, just scared him off, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. holding on to him and just asking him questions, I could see the sweat coming off of these kids. But it just, it's awesome. <laughs> it's, I got it down to a T now. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, so you got into extra work and you were learning the lingo. How did stunt work happen? Because you could be on extra, you could oh, be on extra all day. All day. And people don't know. You could get lines all day, but stunt work is a different road. It absolutely is. So how did so how did that happen? So so I'm on set and um you know I realized oh I want to do acting obviously I want to do acting I want to do yeah, acting. Yeah. So I, I leave doing extra work about four or five months because I feel like I already know the lingo. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and extra work is great. A lot of people make a make a living out of that. Yeah. And they and a lot of those people, most of them, they don't they don't want to talk on camera. They can't. They're afraid, which is fine. Yeah. But I wanted to be there. I wanted yeah, to yeah, be yeah. an actor. So now I'm acting, and then I'm I'm looking around and I'm getting hired to the do these these uh these action roles and they're telling me by per contract that I can't do the fighting or the, or the uh, driving and I'm thinking but I can yeah, yeah. no that we have different people to do that I'm like you do who's that it's just it's called stunt stunt players uh -huh. stunt performers I'm like really they doing the same thing that I know I can do they're like yeah but it's just different you know they either I'm like is there a training for that they're like oh we, nobody knows anything anything, anything, anything it's like the Illuminati I don't yeah, know, they like, exist what? but we don't know I'm like whatever so then I get on and I'm looking at these guys, and I'm like, all right, oh, I could do that. I could definitely do that. Uh, and in stunt work, it's not something that you could just jump into. You yeah. have to make, you know, you have to build relationships. So every set that I was, that I was in, I introduced myself to that, the stunt coordinator, the stunt players. You know, throw my resume and my headshot to the to the stunt coordinator, uh, letting them know what I could do, what I could do. Now it's it, here in LA, it's, it's different. In, in Illinois, in Chicago, it's you know. A few years ago, you could either be a stunt person or an actor. You can't do both, right? Really? Oh, it's, oh, it's frowned upon. Yeah, it's frowned upon. It's, it's two different... Two different unions? Yeah, two di no, it's the same union. Same union. Yeah, two different demons. Yeah. Okay. It's the same union. Oh, it's on the same tree. It's on the same umbrella. It, it's, it's, it's no different. It's just you're a stunt player or you're this. And, you know, it's a little frowned upon. And I, and yeah. I caught that early on. But you still got to be in there. You still got to be on there. You still got to push. You still got to push. And I was there. I was very positive. I tried to jump jump into the training that they do off-site because they meet a few times a month just training they do seminars, falls right? for themselves not really seminars they just call it you know like you know we're gonna go box training we're gonna do you know yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. so I try to make friends and build relationships off of that and thank God I have and they, they've given me opportunities um, to, to do that um, case in point when I did um, Death Wish I got hired I auditioned for a part and I got it for an acting part but, but there you was went, action. There uh, was action in it, so they had to hire a stunt player differently than. than so me. you had you had your own stunt. I had my own stunt double. Uh -huh. So I had my own stunt double, and I was fine with it, right? Now when I get on scene, you know the director Eli Roth is he's all lovely and happy with the acting side, but then when the stunt player came, he's a great guy. He's, he, he's yeah. a great guy. I know the guy personally. Uh, Eli Wright did. Uh, Eli Roth didn't like the movements. Uh -huh. So he asked me, Enrique, are you able to, are you able to box Replicate and do this? It, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I could try. Damn well knowing that of course can I can't, yeah. right? But by then there's a stunt coordinator there, you know, and then he himself is there. They're, they're already getting paid no matter what. I'm just doing what the director wanted me to do. So I went ahead and did it. The director loved it. I get to put on both for the acting side and the stunt side. Now that's two different paychecks because ah. now I did as an actor yeah, yeah, and I yeah. did as a stunt, which is great, which yeah. is great, and everybody's happy. But that that was that was one of the main the main the main points that helped me with the stunt coordinator, coordinator seeing okay this guy can actually do both. So I'm I'm one of very few that are able to do both here in Chicago, and I'm grateful for that. Is there any stunt work that you would be you would second guess that you would be scared to do. Oh, oh no! If there's any, if there's anything that I that that I'm scared to do, you know, stunt work is very serious. People get, you know, people get hurt. People, people get, actually people die. I know, I know. I hurt. Well, on the Triple X, the, the Vin Diesel movie, somebody yeah. died. Oh, no, somebody that. broke his neck, right? But uh -huh. no, the uh, the last one that oh, that a woman really got told. Well, Deadpool, a female, awesome female uh, motorcycle racer, got hired to do a stunt, and uh, they didn't calculate right the turns yeah, yeah. and she hit a wall and, and died instantly oh wow another one on Resident Evil she was riding a motorcycle awesome stunt I forgot her name she's awesome awesome stunt lady um, she hit a guardrail and lost her arm half of her face I think her leg she's all banged up 
back wow. then. And then Resident Evil, the only, you know, she lost all that, and she only got paid thirty three thousand dollars for that. That's that's. But the, but the I mean, there's insurance for that, right? She's done. She's thirty three. And it's insurance for that, but she's done. She's done as a. Stunt. She can't never. Oh, do she, can't never she can't. She, she doesn't have she's an arm. Dude, I'll show you a picture later on. It's horrible, horrible. Oh my god. Um, yeah, there's things you know. If and and I've turned down, you know, the, I'm as crazy as I am. I've been asked to get hit by a car. I, I haven't drained anything. I, I haven't even been hit by a car in my life uh, before. I'm not gonna do that. I say, I say no. I can't do it. Okay, so there's there's stunt works that you said. Oh, you of know course, what? That, jumping off a build, building. I can't. I could rappel off a building, but jumping off a building to a, to a balloon. I don't know. I'm not comfortable with yeah, that. Yeah, I yeah. haven't trained on it. So no, there's and unfortunately a lot of stunt guys because they don't get a lot of stunt work. They'll say yes. They'll yes, say yes, yes, yes to anything. And, can't and then sometimes it just costs you your life. Yeah, that's it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. God. So, moving on from stunt work, how did you get into fight coordination? Because I've been seeing a few videos online between you and Blaine, who's uh, your partner. How did you get into that? Well, that I just wanted to learn because I never knew about it. I know how to fight. I know how to fight for real. Uh -huh. I don't know how to film it. Um, and I've helped or, you know, helped coordinate, her coordinated some fight scenes. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to, to, you know, practice more on that. So I just picked up a phone, picked up a camera, used a camera phone, the yeah, iPhone, yeah. whatever, and, and, and just practice. You know, went from thirty from a 30-second fight all the way to a five-minute fight. Yeah. Small increments. I mean, it's, it's was technical. Was that what the, the five-minute fight? Was that the one with you and the, and the mustache? Right? Oh yeah, that was that was a little bit. Me and the mustache, me and the mustache. You know, it's just different looks that you know. Yeah. Where I wore, I think I wore a suit on that. You yeah, know, you just did. To, and that's practice for me to fight in a suit, to fight you know different looks, to be a happy fighter, to be yeah. a sad, to be a drunken fighter. Um, it's just practice from and, and still those are little films that if a director ever says Enrique, can you you know how to fight, you know how to coordinate. Have you ever fought drunk? Have you ever fought with a suit? That's yeah. stuff that I could send in as a resume instead of just me a pictures me saying, Yeah, I could do this. Got now they have a visual. Yeah. That's the main reason for me to do it. The main benefit for me is now I have all these little small clips that I could disseminate to people. Yeah. So yeah. either to sell myself so they, they could see this guy could actually knows what he's doing instead of not. Oh, that's dope. So how did um, how did you hook up with, with Blaine with that? Is it something that it was just kind of natural? Blaine and I have known each other since I started this. I, I can't even remember how how did we became friends. I have no idea. But he he's oh no I do know we both got hired uh, to act in a film that never never went out. Never, that never went anywhere. Indie or major? Indie, indie, uh -huh. va uh, vampires, something about vampires, whatever. Uh -huh. Um, and there were some fight scenes, fight scenes in there, and they had hired a fight coordinator, and that coordinator quickly realized that that film was crap. So, but we didn't know that, yeah, so yeah. the director was like, anybody else knows how to fight? They could fight chorea 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 oh, choreograph. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, Blaine raised his hand, I raised my hand, and they kind of put us together. That's how we kind of... That's uh, we what became, you guys... Yeah, we realized, ah, oh, you know what you're doing, I know what you're doing. And then we. You know, in a couple months, we both realized that, that movie was crap, so we both jumped out of that project as soon as we could. And but we still being friends, working on different projects, and, and, uh, and that's how, that's how it worked. That's funny. I forgot about that. <laughs> so out of um, all your indie projects, you had major films. You actually did commercials as well. Which role is that you've played have been the greatest for you? Ooh. Which is your greatest achievement out of all of them? Well, the greatest achievement has to be the bad guy on Death Wish, right? Because that's that's the biggest one. I got to play with John McClane, yeah, um, yeah. Bruce Willis. That has to be the biggest one. But I try to take every, you know, out of the smallest roles, every role, I'm taking something, something out of it. Out of it. And something positive was, whether the movie was either, you know, a bomb or very good, I, I try to take something, I mean, I, I something special out of, out of every movie. The movies that I've done with Raul Colon, it's just, those, any movies that I've done with him yeah. have been, very positive and a little push to, to keep at this because the love that he shows and the love that everybody has on on those films working with him, they they, they push them, they push people, they yeah. push people. Um, and I and I, talking about Raul Colon, you've done uh, a few films. Oh, with absolutely, them, right? absolutely, absolutely. How did how did uh, you guys meet? My brother, my, he used to be Raul Colon used to work security at Walgreens, and my brother being a Chicago police officer, he. Uh, he used to see him and meet him or whatever yeah, yeah. all the time. And at that time, I was just starting to to, to get into film. And Raul told my brother, hey, you know, I want to start filming film because he used to do uh, music videos. Yeah, yeah, with, with his brother. And so Manny, my brother, was like, yo, my little brother, he's starting into film, he's acting. 
in Raul Colón didn't know not one actor, so we connected. Yeah, yeah. And 10 minutes into our conversation, we were like, yo, we need to work together. And a weekend after that, we already started filming. And we, we both learned. We both learned things that yeah, are very yeah. positive, things that are very negative. And we became best friends. I was in his wedding. Oh, a few years back. Oh, that's, that's how beautiful. close we are. I'm actually the godfather to his, his daughter, his first daughter. Oh, yeah? So it worked out, yeah. It's a real good guy. And his wife are real that's good That's awesome. People. Shout out Raul Colon, man. Absolutely, How's it going, brother? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you, you've done commercials as well. If you were to choose, right, would you do commercials yeah. or, or a major film? Which one would you do and why? Oof. Look, if it was strictly for the love, then yeah, obviously movies... Uh, be out in theaters whether I make you know huge money or, 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 or not I mean being in, in movies is ultimately the, the, the thing that I love to do yeah now if I was strictly about the money commercials doing national commercials those guys make the progressive woman from commercial the uh, insurance she, she, I uh, can't flow? Even, she's made yeah I can't even imagine she is I, made. I just she's see, the face of the product I want to see her, her bank account I can't <laughs> even imagine those, those people that do national commercials they're they're making they're racking up money. They're, they're in commercials 15 seconds, 30 seconds. Ridiculous, ridiculous. I, they get paid by every time it gets played, right? Uh, the royalties? A percentage of that, yeah. It's all a percentage of that. Um, yeah, if it was strictly for the money, commercials all day. I mean, I know people that just rather do commercials. And again, I know people that don't want to do any type of commercial work and knowing that the money is ridiculous. Uh-huh. Ridiculous. What was uh What was your first? I know your your first indie film was Vampire. That Vampire thing. That Vampire. Well, no, I didn't. Even, it didn't. Even, we didn't even start it. So, oh, you never. No, you it never. was just. It was training for six, seven months, even before I, I joined, and there was another three months. And then they just it figured out that it was ass, and they it just was just scrapped the, it. The guy was just talking smack, trying to build himself up. All right, so so screw that Vampire movie. What was the first indie film that you've done? Uh, through and through that came out oh it has to be the first Raul Colon uh, Purge Chicago Anarchy the Purge Anarchy oh yeah 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 Yeah, we learned a lot in that film we did it all in one day and it was exhausting it was fun no but we learned a lot we we did learn a lot how many films have you done with them I think six I think six yeah I remember uh, I was watching uh, one of his films a few weeks ago it was the one where the, the girls in the library and then you were playing the best friend Jen Jen, Jen, yes. yeah, 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 that yeah, was a good scary. movie. That was, that was good. We did that in a, in a hospital in Evanston, very creepy, underground. That was a hospital? That was a hospital. Really? That, that was like the, so where she, it looked like it was a library. It's yeah, where it, they yeah. keep their old files. So it was a basement. It was great. No it way. It was scary. It was scary with lights on. It was insane. Yeah, it was a great location. That that, that, was, that was a good location. Oof. I like the whole, like the whole scene. That was scary. Yeah. And you did another one uh, where I, I saw when it first came out when he first released it. Uh, you played your character was Brazilian. You remember that one? Oh, that was uh, Blood, Blood Diamond. Blood Diamond, right? Blood Diamond. That was another fun one. It took a few years to, to, to finish, but it was another fun one. Yeah, we got to travel a little bit for that. Um, what got you into writing your own film? Because I know you wrote OBK. Well, because one of those things is is that you know I I don't want to get. I want to get cast or typecast. Uh-huh. So I've been playing, you know, either bad guy, which are fun. I love playing a bad guy, right? The, the better, you know, a good guy doesn't look that good unless a bad guy is that bad yeah, to yeah. me in films. So I like playing a bad guy, but I don't want to get typecast as a gang banger, you know, um, a murderer, hitman. So the best and the best thing to do for me was to, you know, come up with my own con- content, right? So I started writing different things, and not only for myself. I know actors are in the same place. I know actors that are only cast as doctors, nurses, lawyers. Yeah. They're too goody two shoes. They won't and you're not able murder. to diversify. Yeah. Your, your, so I your get resume. together. I, I get together with. I write my own content and, and get together with those actors that also need help, um, trying to d- diversify their their character. Yeah, yeah. And it's been working out for me. I mean, I didn't know anything about writing, so I look it up. You know, I just start pick up a pen and start writing. How long did it take you to write OBK? Ooh, like six, seven months. And it took me, I think it was 36 drafts by the really? end. Really? 36, it, it went from like four pages to I think like 47 pages. And, it, and the, if that's all you're thinking about, that's all you're dreaming about, it just keeps getting bigger. And it could have gotten bigger. It probably still is. I haven't, I know I've added more pages. I just haven't, I haven't thought how many pages is it now, but yeah. Like 27, 28. Insane. Around there. Insane. Insane. <laughs> so now that you're writing your own uh, film, 
because for so long you were you were you know playing the actor you were mm. given the script how different is it between you know you being an actor and you being the one to actually write it how much more different do you see oh it's thing? difficult it, these these writers and then i've noticed with directors too these writers there's things you you got to attach in the detail you know i want to be able to first of all i want to be able to, to to see a movie that makes sense not that jumps from you know to scene to scene but yeah. it doesn't really you know it leaves you with questions right uh -huh. um so it's just open the detail reading you know trying to fill in those ga gaps you know and being an actor you just give me a script okay I'm, this is your movie i'm gonna read what what's on paper and, and give it give him my take on that but then you see it on film you're like oh there's some questions here and there how did he get here well how did what movie did i see I saw uh, Shaw vs. Hobbs. Have you seen that movie? No, I want to watch it. I want to watch okay, it. Okay, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of both. I'm a fan of action. Obviously, you know, I wanted to see that movie more on the stunt side because they use a ton of stunt players for that. Yeah, great. visually it's great. Visually it's great, but they there's a part that they jumped from a full-on night fight, like the beginning of the night fight, and five seconds later it was broad daylight and they're fighting, and it was still like the beginning of the fight. Uh huh. Like, you know, and I was looking around to see if anybody else caught that, and I could see people in the theater looking at themselves like, "How did that? Well, how did we? What did we miss? Yeah, yeah. Did we miss two minutes? They went straight from, you know, when they're running, when you know they're in Hawaii and they're running. Ah, uh -huh. it started full on night. It looked like it, like it started at night, right? Okay. And then when they first hit the guy, broad daylight like, like this. How did they not catch that? So it? continuity issues. What? Uh -huh. How did they not catch that? Now I gotta um, watch that with that in mind. Dude, it's gonna drive me insane. Insane. And there was a few parts, but that one was the one that made okay, really? Or they had they had, you know, I'm not talking bad about the movie. It's yeah, just, yeah. you know, as as a as an actor and now as a writer, I'm able to really see the yeah, things that people. You, don't you catch. see everything from a different light. Exactly. You, you know, the girl had forty eight hours before her whatever she had inside her was gonna explode and kill the world, right? Yeah, yeah. But it looked like like they were they were trying to find a cure for like a week, you know. <laughs> they flew, they flew. Okay. First of all, it drove me nuts, right? I'm, I'm not that great at geography, right? So, but they're in Paris. <laughs> they found their 24 hours into her having a, a, a whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the 24 hours in, so now they got another 24 hours before it's before it explodes. Uh -huh. So now they're going from Paris, flying all the way to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many hours is that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but they get there at that time, right? And then uh, they have another two days in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yo, this woman should have been dead. What movie know, is this? Hobbs versus Shaw. Really? Bro. Dude, st stuff like that. It was it was like, yo, they missed, they missed yeah, that part. I was in I mean, the I'm, theaters, but I'm just going to buy it on DVD to watch it. Screw that. I'm telling you, yeah. I mean, it, it was, you know, the cinematic part of it, I like the fighting part, I like. But yeah, they were they were like a bunch of reaching. Issues. They were really reaching. I mean, they could have put put them on a jet to get there, but, uh, but from no. And then they took a regular. And they killed it because they took a regular airline, right? Because now they have they have <laughs> they gotta uh, go through the TSA checkpoints and they gotta wait to get boarded. The U.S. Marshal was a Negrito, the, the funny uh, guy, Kevin, Kevin Hart. Hart. Kevin Hart. So yeah, so you know they took the oh, it was, whatever, whatever. <laughs> Don't get me started. Those are two things that I was like, yo, yo, they're reaching. So they're really what, what was the the best advice given to you? In acting. Oh, just just work, just just work, just work. Because you're gonna, especially auditioning. You know, it's it's really disheartening when you're going for a role and you don't get it, right? Yeah. But you don't know the reasons why. You yeah. don't know if you know you, you know when you're blown. And it can literally be just because of the way you look. Right. Absolutely. And I've gotten that, but because usually most 90 percent or 98 percent of the time you don't get feedback. They don't tell you why you didn't get oh, it. Yeah. They're seeing so many people. They're just getting it's a guy who want this and this guy I want to see again. Yeah, yeah. But usually you don't get it. So now you're beating yourself up. And this was sometimes you just blow it. And you know when you blow it because there's times that I've been there and just said I'm sorry guys. I I, I got nothing. I. I I, I got nothing. I get, I'm sorry. And lights. just walk out. And they respected me for that because I thought I'm never going to get called in to, for these people. Yeah. And they say, you know, I'm back a week later and they're like, this is the guy. Oh, you're the guy who, who mm. decided, okay, I think this is more for you. And boom, then I get it. You, uh -huh. know? you just be honest with yourself. And you say, I'm sorry, I don't got anything? Like, yeah, you, I tell you. I go to the audition room. And I say, would, yeah, no, I because I'm thinking I got it, right? So, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I got the lines or whatever. Uh -huh. And you just draw a blank. And yeah. it happens. You just brain fart. You don't know anything. What are you gonna do? Just stare at them? Some somebody's guy has, has to say something. To me, really? I'd rather say something before they tell me what. So you've got so you've gotten the part 
off of. Yeah. I, I'm, no, I'm, I've gotten. I've you gotten, gotten a call back, back for another it. audition, okay. thinking, man, they, you know, I was un- either unprofessional or, or whatever. No, yeah. no, this, and at the end, they're like, hey, you're the guy who had nothing last week. <laughs> I think we have something better for you this time. Try. Oh, and then I was awesome. like, yo, okay, and I had it. They're, you know, you just know. You just actors know when they blow an audition, completely blow an audition. Uh-huh. And they know when they did an awesome audition, and that's the ones that they get beat themselves on. Yeah. Because you're like, why? So, why? why? I gave it, it my all. No. So I try not to, for me. I try to make it a thing as soon as I step out of the audition, forget, 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 forget. Forget, forget about forget, the whole forget, thing. Forget about everything and move on to the next. Because then that, that happened with you with Death Wish, right? That like, you did it happened. and then like you were... I, I did it. It was supposed to be... Were... Everything was supposed to be in, in, in English. The, uh, uh, the dialogue was supposed to be all in English. Um, and it was like a kettle call. It was. I saw there was 20 people that looked like me before and I was like in the middle. And then the audition room was small, so you could see all the different ways these guys did it. They yeah, were yeah. all great. They were all great. They took like four of my ideas, and I knew I had nothing else to get. I, I knew it. it was, so I knew I was going to go in there and tell them, I got nothing that you haven't seen before. I got uh-huh. nothing. I'm sorry. So instead of that, I went in there, and last minute, I started talking in Spanish. And they all started looking at me. There were six people there. I had, they were looking at me, what is this guy saying? And then I stopped and I said, that's my audition. I was going to step off. And they stopped me and, I, and told me, you know, this is in English, right? I said, yes, but I've heard these guys say it, you know, four different ways that I would have said it. This is, the, this is how I see the character. And they're like, all right, two months. And usually you get a call back you know, a few days, yeah, a yeah. week later. I didn't hear anything for two months. So my, you you kind of figured at that point. Like, oh, I, I, re- I knew I knew as soon as I said it in Spanish that I wasn't going to get it. That was just my take on it. I was like, forget it. <laughs> and your mind were like, but yeah, hold, you didn't get yeah, it. Yeah, you didn't get it. So two months later, my agent was calling me. No, I was at the gym. I was at Export. Yeah, yeah. And I left my phone in my locker, and, and it was like 9 o'clock at night. And I got like 10 missed calls. My agent said, Enrique, call me, call me, call me. I'm like, yeah, what's up? She's like, remember that Death Wish audition? Yeah. And I, I totally forgot about it. Forgot about it. I was like, I haven't auditioned in two, three weeks, weeks. No, it was like two months ago. They, they, you, you got it, you got it. But they're film. it was a Friday, you're filming Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. And I was like, what movie are you talking? Enrique, the Bruce Willis one. I was like, what? And I told them, look, listen, I said, they were like, it, whatever, you got it, they want you. <laughs> so I went and I was able to talk to the director. I was like, what, why did you guys pick me? And he told me, Eli Roth, I like, Enrique, I had no idea what you said, but it sounded and, and, and it was just mean. Yeah. So I want you to do the same thing. And at the end of the day, the thing that ended up making the cut uh, was the English was the version. English one. And you did it in Spanish? And I, I did it all in Spanish. So uh, I threw a little bit of the edited part was half English, half Spanish. So, I mean, just just do what you feel. You yeah, know? Yeah. And it's just filming, the film industry is a trip, bro. It's a trip. <laughs> it's a trip. Uh, all right. Uh, before I sign out, man, do you want to give a special shout out to anybody? Oh man, everybody doing film, man. Everybody has helped me, like Raul, man. I, I, I got you. We're gonna do some great work together. Yeah, oh, my parents, my family, um, all those people. My 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 agent, Michelle Hayes. All those that I work with, that were either positive or negative. They helped build me. They helped build me do this. Uh, my kids for for giving me the time away from them because I know that's that's very hard. Yeah. I have to go out, out of town a lot or. Or, or miss birthdays or yeah. you know time with them so just so I could do something that I love to be able to end up providing for them yeah, yeah. I really appreciate them for that and, and just other actors and filmmakers director writers that that are in that 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 line whether I'm gonna keep doing this or not if you love it keep doing it just keep doing it uh, if you love it it'll come it, it'll come whether it is for money or just for the love of it, it it'll come just keep at it all right man Thank you, brother, for actually having a chance to sit down with me. I appreciate the time that you took out your day for this. Right on. Um, I respect the living shit out of you. I, I love your hustle, and I, I love what you bring, and I, I, I love what you're thinking of when it comes to film and how you write it. Um, yeah, keep doing your thing, and I'm, and I'm glad that I'm able to work with you. Right, for man? sure, man. For sure. All right. All right. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please make sure you hit that subscribe button to stay centered on all Indie Center podcast episodes. If you are an independent creator and have a story to share and want to have a sit down, please email me at indiecenter.podcast at gmail.com. That's indiecenter.podcast at gmail.com. If you have sponsorship inquiries, I'd love to help local businesses. 
please email me at indiecenter.podcast at gmail.com. Until next Monday, guys. Peace.